Great, well, we have a packed agenda today. I wanna to welcome you all to August Urban Ag Hour, a collaboration with the Urban Ag Production Small Scale and Beginning Farmer Program at University of Arizona Cooperative Extension and USDA Farm Service Agency and NRCS. Today, we'll be hearing from two great speakers, Danielle Runyon, who is the Arizona Department of Agriculture Produce Safety Program Manager. She'll be talking about all things food safety, followed by a talk with FSA Farm Loan Chief, Fred San Nicholas, who will be talking about farm loans, different types, how to access them. We're thrilled you all are here to join us, and I don't want to waste much time with, with our speakers, so we'll jump right on in and hear from Danielle. Right. Can you hear me? Does that sound okay? Yes, we can hear you. Going to get started. Uh, like Colleen said, my name is Danielle Renyan, and I'm the program manager for our produce safety rule program at the Arizona Department of Agriculture. Uh, today, I will just be speaking about the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was signed into law um, in 2011 by President Obama. This was actually the most sweeping reform of the United States food safety laws in over 70 years. Uh, the overall objective of the Food Safety Modernization Act, or uh, we like to also call it FISMA, uh, is to focus on prevention of food safety issues. So there's actually seven pieces of FISMA, but I'm going to briefly just talk about the produce safety rule. Um, this includes the standards for growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of um, produce for human consumption. Uh, this was actually the first mandatory federal standard when it comes to growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, so our division at the Arizona Department of Agriculture administers the produce safety rule, and there are some requirements, and I'll go through them today. And so the, this is our team. Uh, it's composed of Ed Foster and Teresa Lopez, who are the PIs or principal investigators for the grant. I'm the program manager. And then we have two, edu two educators, Norm and Val, and two inspectors, Sade and Brad. And so why is this regulation important and re um, relevant to your farm? So uh, produce safety affects every fresh fruit and vegetable farm, regardless of your size. So if you're a large operation or even a backyard grower, um, it can be challenging for a number of re reasons. Um, some of those reasons is because fresh produce is consumed raw and there is no kill step to destroy pathogens that are present. Uh, we do know that pathogens are the biggest food safety hazard in fresh produce. Uh, but what is a pathogen? If you're familiar, um, pathogens are human microorganisms that are capable of causing illness or disease in humans. There's three primary groups of pathogenic microorganisms that we are concerned with when we're talking about fresh produce, and that's bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Uh, but why is this challenging when you're growing, harvesting, packing, and holding uh, fresh produce? Uh, well, it is challenging for farmers because microorganisms cannot be seen uh, to the eye. Uh, it's very difficult to detect if contamination has occurred and contamination is often sporadic when it comes to farming, uh, making it difficult to detect because it's only affecting a small portion of your crop. Uh, sometimes we have third-party audit systems that uh, require us to test our produce but even testing of the produce can uh, make it difficult to detect. So uh, that's one reason why the FISMA produce safety rule uh, focuses on prevention, because once contamination has occurred, which is a common misconception, uh, there's no amount of washing at the farm level or even in the consumer's home that's going to remove that contamination. Uh, once contamination has occurred, we want to discard that produce. Uh, and, but why is produce challenging? Um, it's challenging because we have rough surfaces, uh, stem scars, uh, and unique textures on the produce. And these are all great places for pathogens to hide. Um, so regardless of the commodity, we want to focus on preventing any food safety issues. And so that's basically the background um, of the produce safety rule is focusing on the prevention of foodborne illness outbreaks. Now, there's five steps towards produce safety, and these five steps can help you prevent any risks on your farm. Uh, the first step 
uh, requires you to assess your farming practices. And once you assess your farming practices, you can identify the risks on your farm. And once you've identified those risks, you can implement practices. And these practices can help you reduce and prevent those risks. We like to call those good agricultural practices. Uh, the third step is going to require you to monitor your practices daily. And this will help you um, identify if there are problems in your farming practices and what you can do to prevent those issues. Uh, the fourth step is using corrective actions. So if you have identified some issues on your farm that could cause contamination, you can then do a corrective action uh, that will prevent any of that contamination going to market. Uh, we always say keep records. So the fifth step is keeping records, documenting uh, the good things that are happening on your farm, uh, documenting uh, practices so you can monitor them. And then keeping those records is really going to help you identify when you need to use a corrective action. Um, if you're interested in selling your produce at grocery stores or even farmers markets, uh, documentation could be required by your third party audit systems, uh, but it also is required by the produce safety rule. Uh, so it is important that you are training everyone that's in your operation, even if it's a small farm, uh, making sure that everyone knows uh, what they are supposed to do, and that can help prevent issues as well. And so going back to that training, uh, who exactly needs the training when we're talking about a farming operation? Uh, if you have managers, if you have office staff, if you even have volunteers, interns, or family members that work in your operation, all of them need to be trained, uh, especially when it's coming to food safety, not just the tasks that they need to do, uh, but what should be trained. So uh, we can help you do that. And that's one reason why I'm talking to you today. Uh, but they should be trained on practices that they're responsible for. Um, but then they also need to be trained how to identify food safety risks, how to reduce the risks if they do find something or an issue on your farm. And then ultimately, regardless if you're an owner, a manager, or a supervisor, uh, setting a good example uh, for the rest of the employees in your farming practice is really important and can help you reduce any risks. So when we're talking about the produce safety rule or any third party audit system, uh, training is often a requirement. Uh, it is mandatory by the produce safety rule. And uh, we in, at the Arizona Department of Agriculture can help you with that training. Uh, we do run courses monthly. One of them is the Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training, and that does satisfy the requirement that a supervisor must be trained at least annually, uh, and that'll help you meet any requirements, either from a third-party audit system or with the produce safety rule, and that's really important if you want to put your produce into market. So how can we help you at the Arizona Department of Agriculture? Well, we do offer a number of trainings throughout the year uh, to help you meet the requirements of different regulations, especially the produce safety rule. Uh, we want to help farmers understand good agricultural practices. And on the previous slide, I did mention that we host the Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training Monthly. This is a remote course, so you're able to take it similarly to how you are logging on today. Uh, we also offer free on-farm consultations where we go out to your farm and we look at your practices and we can help you improve those practices. Uh, we do also team up with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension to do that uh, when we offer you those free educational farm visits. All you do is have to ask us and we can help you. Uh, throughout the year, we do do special topic workshops and I'll talk about that a little bit later in my presentation. Uh, but we want to make sure that all farmers within the state of Arizona has the knowledge necessary to produce safe food. And so we do have two trainers that I mentioned. Norm is based in Phoenix and Val is based in the Yuma area and they conduct training throughout Arizona. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the training that they conduct. I mentioned the course that happens monthly. Uh, we do team, um, our team includes uh, members from the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. So you can see Dr. Tana Rock, Natalie Russell, and Dr. Lucy Lee. And then we also team up with Cornell University to conduct Spanish trainings throughout the state of Arizona. So we have Davis, Mariana, um, and Yuli who 
team up with Val to conduct Spanish trainings. So far since the program that started in 2018, uh, we have held 75 courses in Arizona and trained over a thousand people. And again, that meets the requirement of the produce safety rule. Our free consultation, uh, we do offer on-farm readiness reviews. I know a lot of you are smaller operations, uh, but if you were to increase your sales and become regulated by the produce safety rule, we do help you prepare for that. Uh, we do offer on-farm technical assistance, but we also offer remote or virtual technical assistance. And this is just the numbers of what we've completed since the regulation started. Uh, this year in May, we started what's called an on-demand uh, supervisor training and harvest crew training. We felt that there was gaps with training for harvesters. Uh, so if you do have Spanish speaking harvesters and you'd like to get them trained, uh, we have Val and a representative from Cooperative Extension come out to your harvest harvesters and they do a 15 minute training. We also do a supervisor training, which is two hours long. Um, and some of the items that we talk about are specifically related to harvesting. So how to identify contaminated produce, um, what type of personal protective equipment is necessary and how to properly use it. Uh, we do do hand washing because that's a big uh, point when you're talking about employees touching fresh produce. And then animal intrusion and, and what to do if an animal, whether it's domesticated animals or if it's wildlife, uh, coming into your farming operation and how to, one, if you need to mitigate and get rid of them, and how to identify the feces in the field. Um, so those are all the topics that they usually train on, and they do also uh, train on special topics if it's requested, so if you'd like them to talk about something else. Uh, and they do have activities, so it's fun for the harvesters to um, to participate in this training. And so now I've talked about a lot of training that we offer. I'm just gonna briefly go into some of the Arizona requirements that are related uh, to the produce safety rule. The first one is our farm registration. So it is required uh, that all farms, regardless of their size, uh, complete an annual uh, registration and submit that farm registration prior to October 1st of each year. Uh, this is accessible through the Arizona Department of Agriculture's website, and it only takes a few minutes to complete. The registration is free. Again, it's accessible online. It's a Google form. And the information really helps our program, as well as other programs within the Arizona Department of Agriculture, uh, help the success and um, make sure that we're able to meet farmers' needs. You know, regardless of the size, all farms need to register. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to be receiving any type of inspection, but it helps us improve our education and outreach, which is really important. Um, another piece of the produce safety rule is exemptions. Uh, so there are four different types of exemptions. Three of them are full exemptions from the produce safety rules. So we have our processing exempt, our rarely consumed raw exemption. Both of those are because uh, the produce that are going to processing or if they're often cooked in the consumer's home, they're gonna um, involve a kill step. And that kill step would eliminate any pathogens that are present. And so they, that type of produce is actually not covered by the produce safety rule. Therefore, uh, you would receive a full exemption from the rule. We do have that third full exemption, which is called a micro exempt in the state of Arizona. That's anyone that is growing, harvesting, packing, or holding produce, um, and your produce sales is less than 25000 uh, So you could apply for the micro exemption and be fully exempt from the produce safety rule. Uh, we do have a fourth exemption, which is called qualified exempt. Uh, if the majority of your produce is being sold directly to the consumer, so that could be grocery stores, farmers markets, restaurants, all of that is considered a qualified end user. And if your produce sales is between that $25,000 and $500,000 and your sales are within the state of Arizona, uh, you can apply for a qualified exemption. The only thing different between a full exemption and the qualified exemption is that uh, the farms who qualify for that exemption need to have 
labeling. Uh, so if you're selling produce at a farmer's market, you must include a label, uh, either a sign uh, that identifies your farm name and your address and contact information. Uh, if someone were to get sick, they would be able to contact you and let you know. Uh, if you still have questions about these exemptions or the requirements of the produce safety rule, I do have our information on the last slide and you can reach out to me at any time. Uh, the exemption application can be found online through our website. It's very similar to um, the annual registration. You just complete the application. Once it's approved, you will get sent a certificate uh, through your email that is um, valid for a year from when you submit your application. Uh, you can find this exemption application online at the URL that's listed below in the website. And I will also place that in the chat box when I finish. And so now I'm actually gonna move on to compost. Um, and food safety requirements when we're talking about compost. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about best practices when it comes to food safety. Um, we previously have offered an entire workshop. Uh, it's a day workshop for farmers that specifically just talks about biological soil amendments of animal origin. And uh, we hope to have another one in the future. If you reach out to us and let us know if that's important to you, we will definitely host that again. So when we're talking about soil amendments, there's a few food safety tips that you'll want to include. Uh, there's three primary ways to reduce risks. So one, uh, the first one is to apply untreated soil amendments to fields that are not planted with produce. And when I'm talking about untreated or raw, I'm talking about manure that has not been composted. Um, the second way that you can reduce your risks on your farm is to treat or process raw soil amendments. So that would be composting. That's one way that you could eliminate pathogens if you're following the right steps. Uh, the third way that you can uh, reduce your risk on your farm is to maximize the time between your application of your soil amendment and when you harvest your produce. Um, you always want to be sure to monitor manure and compost storage areas so that they do not contaminate your packing areas, your fields, or your water sources. Uh, it's really important that you're putting them in a place that's going to minimize your runoff, your leaching, and any type of wind drift. Uh, this is also a way that you can reduce contamination of your crops, your water sources, and your handling areas. Uh, other ways that you can reduce your risks is to cover your piles. So when you're making your compost, if you're keeping them covered, uh, you could also build berms uh, around the area to prevent any runoff into your field. Uh, when you're making your compost, if you separate the raw manure from your finished compost, that will keep your finished compost post from being recontaminated. And then also when you're covering it and keeping it in a higher area, it can minimize animal access. And we want to do that because we do know that animal feces has pathogens within it. Uh, therefore, if you're keeping that separate, that can reduce your risk when we're talking about it. Uh, training is a big thing. Uh, when it comes to compost making, you want to make sure that all of the workers who are making the compost are handling it in a specific way that you're not having it recontaminated. Uh, another way that you can prevent contamination is uh, segregating your tools and equipment. So any tools that you're using with raw manure should not be used with your finished product. Um, and always keeping records uh, of your treatment process. So when you're making uh, your compost on, on the next page, I'll talk about uh, the specific things you'll want to document, but there's a um, requirement for the temperature, meeting that temperature requirements and also following your turnings uh, should be documented and is a requirement by the produce safety rule. So if we're talking about the produce safety rule uh, and you're making compost, you wanna make sure that if the compost is containing any type of ingredients of animal origin, and um, we're talking about manure or animal byproducts, the best method for reducing those risks is to follow the two approved processes. So on this slide, we see the first one static, 
Um, and then we have our turned composting um, that are approved because they are scientifically validated processes for composting. Uh, each process needs to be monitored and meet the requirements in order to have added adequate pathogen reduction. So that's our goal. And following these processes will ensure that you do have that adequate pathogen reduction as long as you're keeping them in place where it's not becoming recontaminated. Um, I don't have uh, sufficient time to really cover all of composting in detail, uh, but for those of you who are interested in composting and the food safety practices that are associated with all soil amendments, I do suggest that you sign up for our Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training course. This is the course that happens every month and it is remotely. You can sign up for the course on our website um, and you can also contact me directly and I would be happy to answer any of your questions questions about composting or any other soil amendments um, that you're interested in using. We also do have a lot of vendors that we work with. So if you're interested in purchasing either compost or other type of soil amendments, I can connect you with those people as well. Um, so I do want to just mention briefly, I'm trying to look at my time here. I went through a lot of that uh, a little bit faster than I expected, uh, but we do have pre-season and post-season webinars. Our pre-season webinar usually takes place in September, October. We do have one coming up. It's Wednesday, September 20th. Uh, it goes from 9.30 a.m. To, uh, to 12 p.m. You hear from everyone um, on our team, but you also hear from Dr. Chana Rock at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. We talk about good practices that you can implement during your season, uh, what type of items or issues that we've seen throughout the last season. Um, in the post webinar, that usually happens in April, May, um, and we talk about what we've seen through the previous season and how uh, we can improve those practices. We do also, also talk about special topics related to the produce safety rule. Uh, this is a free webinar. You can register online, and if you use that QR code, you should be able to take a picture, and it'll bring you to uh, the registration for that as well. Um, I do just want to mention again, uh, we're here to help you. Uh, we offer a number of trainings, um, and we're always interested in what trainings you like us to offer. So if you have a specific area that you would like us to host a workshop, uh, one that we got requested is about soil amendments. So previously, we hosted a day uh, where we got um, professors from the University of Arizona, as well as um, soil amendment vendors to come in and talk to you about their processes, how to use uh, the soil amendment, uh, what they have for you, and uh, specific practices related to the produce safety rule, but also related to soil health. Uh, so if you are interested in that, uh, we'd like to get feedback. Uh, if you want certain webinars, uh, we have had a webinar on um, agricultural water and how to make sure that you're not contaminating your produce when you're using production water or post-harvest water, so anything after harvesting. Um, I'm going to leave my contact information as well as my team's contact information and then the link to our website. So if you go to the Arizona Department of Agriculture's website and you search under plants and produce, you will find the Food Safety Modernization Act, and that is our webpage. But also at the Arizona Department of Agriculture, we have a, a number of different resources that we can help you with. I know you're also going to hear from the Farm Service Agency uh, today after me, uh, but I do want to just put up some of the resources that we do have on our webpage that you may be of interest to. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these type of resources, uh, you can contact me directly, and I would love to help you uh, with any of these programs, as well as answer any of your questions that you may have um, after the other presentation. And so that is all I have for you. I'm going to stop you. sharing. Thank you so much, Danielle. And yeah, please put questions in the chat. I saw a couple in there, but we will have time to to uh, ask Danielle any and all food safety questions at the end of this. And now I'll introduce Fred San Nicolas to speak on, on all things FSA farm loans. Thanks, Colleen. So thanks again for the opportunity to talk about the farm loan program specifically. So 
before I go into specifically what I do and, and the Farm Service Agency, just wanted to provide some be, um, brief background and introductory for myself. So um, name is Fred Nicholas, and the Farm Law Chief for the state of Arizona. I've uh, been with the agency for over 14 years now. First half of my career, I was a, a, I was a program technician, loan officer out in Guam. Guam is island in the Western Pacific. I've done work out in Guam and all the islands over there, Commonwealth and Northern Marianas, Palau, Federal States of Micronesia and Marshall Islands. I've also done work out in Hawaii, the Big Island in Hilo, manager in Maui, out work out in America, Samoa. And the second half of my career, I've been here in Arizona, uh, more as the farm loan chief. And my role in the scheme of things is I oversee the loan programs for the state. So um, I have, um, I'm happy to uh, give a brief overview about our loan programs. And again, if there's any questions, put it in the chat, then I'll be at, happy to answer any uh, questions that you may have. So Farm Service Agency, one of the many different agencies under the USDA umbrella, um, FSA came about when it used to be Farmers Home Administration and it broke into two. Uh, and it became rural development that does the single family housing and farm service agency that specifically does um, the agriculture portion of it. Uh, within farm service agency, there's two different sides, the farm program sides that does with farmer assistant programs, disaster related programs, and I specifically oversee the, the, the loan side. So um, for the loan side, um, there's, there's two different sides to the farm service agency. Uh, loan programs. There's guarantee loan programs and direct loans. Guarantee loans are made and serviced through conventional lenders. So these are lenders that you have relationships with or don't have relationships with. They would go to USDA Farm Service Agency and ask for a guarantee. The guarantee is pretty much in place is that if a borrower was to default on the loan, USDA Farm Service Agency will pay up to 95% of that loss. But for the most part, um, Producers who are not able to get their own financing or guarantee loans um, come through to us for direct loans. Direct loans are made in service through our, our county offices. We do have county offices located all across Arizona um, that service um, um, multiple counties. Um, these are our main programs over here. Uh, I'll highlight the, the, the two most commonly used ones over here. And, and, and try to uh, tailor it for the audience today. So there's farm operating loans, ownership, youth loans, and emergency loans. Uh, for operating loans, these are things that range from your feed, seed, fertilizer, all the way up to your intermediate assets, machinery, equipment. So anything that falls within that, that scope of range, that umbrella fits under our operating loans. Uh, terms for the, the operating loans range from one to seven years, and the terms we usually are usually dictated by the use of the proceeds. So something like your feed seed fertilizer can be termed out to 12 months, up to 24 months. Machinery, equipment, breeding livestock, up to seven years. Um, there's a $400,000 loan limitation uh, at, for the direct loan side, and the interest rate for the operating loan as of this month is 4.875. A uh, common question that's usually asked about our interest rates, it's a fixed rate. And let's say that um, you get approved for a loan in August at that 4.875, and our interest rate lowers down to 4.75, 4.5 for the next month, and you close on the loan. Um, FSA gives you the lower interest rate of either approval or closing. So at that lower interest rate in September, if it was 4.5, you would get that 4.5 for the uh, operating loans. Overview over ownership loans. These are things that are usually um, the main purpose of the ownership loans is to purchase real estate, major capital improvements. Um, loan terms for this can go up to 40 years. There's a $600,000 loan limitation. Uh, interest rate for this month for our ownership loans is 5%. Um, it's a very good program in the sense that um, the, the ownership loan can finance 100% of the appraised value of the property. So the, the golden example that I usually give is that you're purchasing a property at $100,000, it appraises at $100,000, we can finance $100,000. Um, there's no origination fee, which is common for most residential or mortgage loans. So um, USD charges no um, origination fees or uh, lending costs associated with that. We pay for the appraisal and at minimum, the only thing that most applicants um, 
pay outside of their pocket is title and escrow, which is a variable sort of cost. Um, for for the microloan specifically for the audience over here, it's a branch of um, our regular operating loan and ownership loans. The, the, the caveat or the unique thing that makes it a microloan is the, the threshold of $50,000. So if an applicant applies for a loan that is $50,000 or less, um, it can fit the microloan um, category for our loan programs. So how this benefits any potential applicant coming in for the smaller loan size is that it's uh, lower documentation, lower requirements regarding this loan. So how I, I, how I try to communicate or convey the, the microloans is that um, there's, there's a certain level of expectation for um, our loans over here. So someone coming in for a microloan um, wouldn't need as much expertise or to be a subject matter expert in their in their operations, whereas someone coming in for um, a max loan of six hundred thousand or four hundred thousand, um, there there's an expectation of knowing inside and out um, how the operation is going to work because the the fall from a, a max loan is higher than than someone coming in for uh, fifty thousand dollars, which is still a lot of money. So uh, don't get me wrong. But our microloans is there in place to help those producers looking to start off their their dreams of beginning a farm operation or take that next step. Um, other loan programs that we do offer um, that's a, right, well, available um, is our youth loans. These are loans that are tailored for um, young adults or um, young kids that are between the 10, age of 10 to 20. The intention of this is just to try to provide a a mechanism for for um, children or teenagers that are looking to you know start an agriculture venture that is smaller term, um, uh, very small in operation, so they can learn a little bit about what a loan entails, but at the same time um, try to gain a valuable um, resource and tool to. Uh, understand that maybe an agriculture operation might be a viable source of income in the in the future. Five uh, five thousand dollar loan limit for the youth loans. Other programs that we do offer emergency loan oh, e loans is um, the emergency loan is in, the intention of this is to help. Like let's say we have a disaster, like you got um, affected by the hurricane um, recently, and it was a declared disaster. Um, it would the emergency loan program is to help producers get their operation to pre-disaster conditions. So if you experience any damage in regards to your production, to physical losses like um, major commercial buildings or residents or anything of that nature, the emergency loan is in place to help producers get back to how it was before that disaster was to happen. $500,000 loan limit, 3.75, which is a, a set rate that's made by Congress. Um, something I want to go over is our um, any any potential applicant coming in for our loan programs. There's a there's a three um, tiered process that we're looking at for any potential applicant is eligibility, feasibility, and security. So I'll go over some of the the common eligibility requirements that are um, that are required for any applicant, but highlight a couple things that are most commonly asked for or questions that are that um, that people or producers have. Um, need clarification on. So some of the things are pretty straightforward. Um, resident alien, U.S. citizen. Um, the second one I do want to highlight is being unable to obtain sufficient credit elsewhere. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go out to a bank and get a denial. If you feel like you can't get commercial credit with or without a guarantee, come to FSA, have us make that determination. We have working relationships with the lenders out there so we can see exactly um, what um, what your finances are because everyone's financial picture is different. So if we feel like you can't get commercial credit, um, then you can come to us and apply with our direct loans. Other common uh, eligibility requirements is legal capacity to incur a loan obligation. So that's pretty much a general understanding that of what a loan is requiring out of a person and and the um, the responsibilities associated with it. Um, other things is uh, applicable education, training, and farming experience. So 
it kind of goes hand in hand with the the level of um, the, the loan amount that you're requesting for. So uh, we use a combination of everything to to be able to just make sure that um, you know, with all intents and purposes, that um, the producers that we we are helping have some sort of reasonable success uh, for their business. So the intention of our loan programs is to try to provide a viable source of income rather than having a person have an expensive hobby. Two, two, two completely different situations. Um, other eligibility requirements here is not delinquent on any US federal debt. If you've had previous loans with FSA, um, no direct losses. Um, the, the other eligibility requirement that I do wanna highlight is acceptable credit history. So Farm Service Agency doesn't look at credit score, we look at overall credit history. So as long as um, there's, um, you know, a reason of, um, we look at your credit report and, you know, there's, if everyone's credit report or financial background is different, like I mentioned, so if there's any trouble in the past, as long as there's a justifiable reason that we've had, uh, you know, you've had any sort of problems in repaying or anything, um, there, as long as there's a reason why that it's, um, and it's not, it's isolated and it's not like if I pull a credit report that month in and month out, there's delinquencies, that's a different story. Whereas um, it could be any reason really like a, a loss of job, medical emergency. Um, the most recent thing that probably affected everyone in general was COVID the past few years. So um, acceptable credit history, you don't look at credit score. Lastly, uh, meet the definition of a family farm after the loan is made. So, so the intention of this is that we help smaller scale farmers and our, our direct loans hit a certain niche of um, applicants. So it's not having any sort of big corporation, your Dole, your Tyson, taking advantage, uh, leveraging federal resources to, um, to, to help them at the lower interest rates that we do offer. Um, some things that we look at for the fees of feasibility side. So uh, we ask our applicants to try to develop a farm business plan. So pretty much an applicant's plan to repay the loan. So it doesn't matter if the loan's a dollar, $600,000, there has to be a plan in, in, in order to put in place to repay that loan. So, so these are some things that we do look at. Balance sheet, which is a snapshot of your current financial condition. So assets mi minus liabilities equals equity. Other things that we do look look at is that if you do have cur, um, existing operating history, we try to create an income and expense projection. So it's a moving picture of the operation year in and year out. So ultimately, what we try to do is that uh, if you have is historical or no, uh, not historical, uh, no no operating history, we try to create a plan, uh, a reasonable plan to to determine that. Ultimately, that there's enough money being made from the farm and any non-farm sources to pay for farm expenditures and your and your personal obligations there. And some of the things that we look at is um, yield and price in, price information. So, for existing operators, that you have existing prices that you do get for your commodities, or if you don't and you're looking to start up a new operation, depending on your your type of business. We do have sources that we can try to use, whether within the agency, state, or county averages that we can help identify to to put a baseline of your um, your 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 business plan there. Lastly, um, got to meet uh, collateral requirements. So something as simple and straightforward as if you're looking to purchase real estate with FSA, um, the the real estate will be used as security for the loan. Um, anything that you're using the proceeds for on the operating loan side will be taken as security. So we can take crops, we can take livestock, we can take machinery, equipment. So it's a case by case scenario. And it's if you have any specific questions on that, then it's best to just um, talk to the offices and, and, and start building that, that working relationship there. Um, just other application tips and tricks over here. Um, good fit, uh, farm business plan is critical. Just being able to convey, put um, you know, ideas to to paper, uh, describing the operation, how you're going to operate it. Every cattle operation um, is different based on how um, a producer or a rancher um, conducts themselves um, business wise. So we try to take a unique approach and and keep an open mind with everyone's um, 
business and how they run it. Uh, short and long terms, we'd like to kind of uh, put individual goals in mind to, to be able to give um, a vision for any potential producer coming into our programs. Other things, plan conservatively. Um, your, 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 your projections should be based off of reliable records or you can, um, otherwise you can always get help from the experts. Um, Danielle is a good resource over there. Our extension agent state programs, another, another um, potential, if another potential program that might be beneficial for producers who are having trouble with projections and everything is that there's a, there's, there's an um, organization called um, Small Business Development Center, which is a branch of, of Small Business Administration. And SBDC, the acronym for short, their, their mission is to help um, individuals create business plans. So I do understand that you have one in the, the Phoenix area, and I believe there's a couple other satellite locations across the state. And I do want to emphasize that um, good financial, again, good financial and production records are important. Um, Again, with, with FSA being a government agency, just want to let you know that our loan funds are congressionally appropriated through Congress. So every, every beginning fiscal year, Congress appropriates funds that are used for our loan programs across the nation. So um, it's, it, there, there might be possibilities because we're, we're into August, September, there might be a, a, a chance that we might be short in funds. But, but um, based on how um, the application is submitted. So this is where it kind of goes into and in play where um, you might, if you've done some research about our loan programs, there was talking about um, beginning farmers or socially disadvantaged minority women farmers. Um, so um, how that categorization takes into impact for FSA loan programs is um, if you were to, self-certify yourself as a social disadvantage or a beginning farmer, and we're short on funds, those producers that are categorized in those um, um, beginning or SDA, beginning SDA, um, if when funds are available, those producers are usually provided uh, funding for their loans um, sooner than others. So I just wanna let you know about that for program funding. Um, to kind of wrap up, just um, letting you know that my role as farm loan chief, I don't typically do loan making and servicing um, with the, in the offices over there, but we do have county offices that cover multiple counties over there. So um, I'll be happy to kind of bridge that connection with our county office and ans answer any general questions. So when you do call um, the specific field or county office that um, you be able to have a, a meaningful conversation with them. Um, then questions will be later on in the um, in the presentation. But here are locations for the offices over there. So if you're located in Maricopa, uh, our office is in Avondale. Mar our, our Maricopa Farm Loan Office Farm Loan Program office covers Maricopa, um, Yuma, and La Paz. Our Pinal Pima office is lo located in Casa Grande and handles uh, Pinal Pima. Um, we do have other satellite offices in Apache County. Uh, Coconino and Flagstaff. Our Cochise office, which is based in Wilcox, covers um, Cochise, Graham, Greenlee, Santa Cruz office. And our, our Navajo County office based out in Holbrook covers pretty much the whole northern part of Arizona, your Navajo, Apache, Coconino, Mojave offices. So, so Colleen, that's pretty much uh, my part over here. Let me just go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. And I'm just going to take this time to throw up a survey on the on the screen here real quick, and then we'll jump right into questions. So the surveys really help us to make sure we're bringing the best curriculum forward to you. Um, there we go. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a quick moment, scan that QR code, click on that link and it'll help us to be sure we're providing the best programming for you in the future. And you can even suggest topics to us for future online and in-person events. I'll leave that up just for a minute longer.
thank you everyone so much. So now we'll just jump right on into questions. I did have some questions that have come up for Danielle in the chat here. Um, and so I know Danielle, you answered some of those in the chat. We're just gonna quickly touch on them again for folks who might have extended questions related to those. But I saw a question about animal integration. And so what are the concerns and what are the steps folks can take if they want to integrate animals into vegetable production for soil health and, and those measures? Great, thank you so much. I actually do have a, a slide that just goes over um, the organic uh, requirements. So we're talking about the National Organic Program. With our produce safety rule, we do advise that farms follow this. Uh, so the biggest thing is that we know that animals carry pathogens in their feces. We don't know that um, according to their shedding practices, if all feces is going to have pathogens. But a good way to protect your produce is to assume that any type of raw feces is going to have pathogens present. Uh, so the biggest thing, if you're interested in incorporating animals uh, for soil health, is maybe to do it prior to harvest. So one thing about the National Organic Standard um, and I could actually put it on the screen just so everyone can see it. Um, if you're looking at uh, the screen, you can see that uh, they suggest that any type of uncomposted manure, so raw manure, uh, should be applied in three ways. And this can uh, prevent any contamination. So one, it can be incorporated in the soil 120 days before harvest. So if you have like chickens or anything that's going to be going onto your field, you want to make sure that it happens 120 days before you're actually harvesting um, any type of crop that's going to be eaten raw. And then the other one is that it could be incorporated 90 days before harvesting those crops that are edible portion is not contacting soil. So maybe if you're thinking about corn, but you could also think about tomatoes. So if any type of produce is off the ground and it's not going to contact the soil, uh, it can be incorporated 90 days prior to harvest. So those are the two um, those are the two requirements that we actually ask you to follow. Uh, but again, we know how much um, manure can be valuable, but we also know that there are certain animals that tend to be reservoirs for certain pathogens. So if we're talking about chickens, that could be salmonella or campylobacter. And if we're thinking about uh, our cows, that could be STEC or E. coli. Um, so we do know that they have those pathogens in their manure. Uh, we just don't know um, due to shedding practices when that will actually occur. So um, yeah, so you can use raw manure uh, as long as you're just following certain practices uh, to help prevent those contamination from occurring. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Another question that popped in for you would be, are produce washing stations and coolers included in the produce safety rules regulation training. Um, sorry, can you repeat that question again? Yeah, are produce washing stations and coolers included in your trainings? Yes, uh, we do have uh, our module six, which goes over anything from harvest on. So your packing houses, uh, any type of cooling methods, your flumes, uh, ice, we do go over all of that in detail um, in our training. And that's day two of the training. Thank you. And I saw that you mentioned micro exempt farms. Um, can you talk a little bit about the micro exempt farms and if a farm has or doesn't have employees about what's required for them? Uh, definitely. So uh, if your farm is producing produce and your average annual produce sales is below that 25,000, you are fully exempt, meaning any requirements uh, for the produce safety rule, you do not have to follow. And I believe the question uh, was regarding training. Uh, we always suggest that food safety training is great for you to take, even if you don't have employees working on your farm. And if you are even a backyard grower, it's always good to understand 
understand the risks when you're growing produce. Uh, but again, none of those requirements would um, you would have to follow. And so when we talk about the produce safety rule, there are a lot of requirements, but it is usually for larger operations because there is a higher risk associated with the amount of produce going into your market. Um, so if food safety training is great, but again, you wouldn't have to take it. Great. I, I also saw Danielle posted some links in the chat for testing your compost, amendments, soil plant, water. Um, so those are in the chat if you need them. I did have a question for Fred message to me. Is there support from the county office to help with filling out details of the application, especially for farmers without much experience in credit applications or without an accounting understanding? That's, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. And, and yes, if, if any assistance is needed for filling out the application, um, our offices are equipped to, to help assist in any capacity. So that's, that's one of our, our main things that we try to do in, in helping out. Great, thank you. And another question that came up via email is how much time on average an FSA farm loan process would take and how to best time loans for when land is available? That's, a, that's another great question. Thank you for that. Um, so so if, if a potential applicant is interested in purchasing property, I would rec highly recommend to start uh, discussing that possibility with with the office that you're going to work with because um, I've I've worked with uh, many producers over the years and and sometimes it's more of just trying to understand everything that's that that they need to know so um, some of the, the nuances that that are unique to FSA specifically compared to conventional lenders is that um, we don't offer um, pre qualifications. So I know that's usually a starting point with a lot of real estate agents or sellers that they want to be sure that you can potentially afford um, the the property that they're that they're selling. Um, it, it it's a case by case basis, so um, it's hard to tell because uh, speaking it in general, um, I would say that um, work with us to try to help develop your purchase agreement to that potential seller. So what we try to do is break down the expectations because uh, for commercial agriculture loans, it, it takes a little bit more time compared to your regular residential loans. So most appraisals in most um, central knowledge bases is that um, people have the perception that appraisal will take a few days, a week. And, and for commercial agriculture appraisals, which needs a specific type of qualification that that takes a little bit more time and being in the Southwest region uh, and it's not uh, not unique to Arizona, but like California, New Mexico and our, our neighbors over here, um, you're, you're talking 30, 45 days, 45 days on average for an appraisal on the commercial side. So um, the, the, the more educated from the beginning, um, I, I ultimately the better equipped that that applicant will be able to have those further discussions with real estate agents or sellers if you're working with them um, directly. So uh, again, um, case by case, uh, I, I, it's best to talk it over with someone like myself for one of the loan officers. Thank you. I also had a question on how many years of farm experience that one needs to have before applying for an FSA microloan. What kind of revenue, what are the examples of education and training experience required? Um, there, there's no specific requirements for the microloan specifically. Someone could be, um, you know, wake up tomorrow and say, I have a dream to start a farm and they want to, they want to um, get a microloan. And, and that's what the intention is, is that it, it's providing an opportunity for the producers to, to get started, to understand our programs and, and give the ability to give it a shot. Um, and then, and that's what the, the intention of the microloan is. So lower documentation, lower requirements, um, it's just someone to have a basic blueprint as far as what they're looking to do and, and see how we can provide that opportunity. Great. And if anyone wants to unmute, ask questions, well, we have Fred and Danielle here. We do have a, a few more minutes. If you're shy about your question, please feel free to message it to me directly and I can ask. We'll give a, a couple minutes here while we have Fred and Danielle for anything food safety, produce safety. 
um, and farm loan related. I see a question in the chat for beginner farmers that are just getting started with the process. Are there resources that help you purchase land, resources that have listings to purchase, et cetera? Sorry, I, yeah, uh, the technology trying to unmute with multiple screens, but but uh, to answer that specific question, um, usually it's um, if you have a general area that you're looking to 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 work on uh, or to purchase property. Sometimes a lot of the success would be just driving around the area, talking to neighbors in in the area, and um, finding out a little bit more information. Uh, real estate agents is always a good tool. Um, word of mouth like i said and and usually um finding out who owns the property whether it be uh fee simple lease whether it would lease with the state uh blm um, that usually is a good start to work on and um you can also ask the office if they have any potential leads as far as um properties that might be um potentially being able to be leased or purchased in the future Thank you so much. If anyone has any last minute questions, I know it was a, a lot to cover today. So please feel free to email myself, Danielle or Fred, and, and we'll be sure to answer any lingering questions. Well, thank you to Danielle and Fred, our, our great speakers today. We appreciate you, we appreciate everyone coming and I will be sending out the recording and survey link in the chat to come. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much.